Excellent. Maybe is Samia still with us? Samia, can you? Would you like? Yeah, to hi, Christelle. Sure, sure. Uh, yes, my name is Samir Mahmoud. I am the training coordinator and part of the sort of program unit. And um, yes, I, I think it's a great opportunity. Great to see Christelle. Uh, she is a surf alumni the way Rob is an UNMAS alumni. Uh, so thanks very much for having us. And I'm going to hand back over to Christelle. Thanks very much, Samir. Good to see you. Uh, I would also ask is Julia, has Julia joined us? Julia Wittig? Julia, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Yes, thank you very much, Christelle. Um, hi, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Julia Wittig. Um, I'm a program officer at the Surf Secretariat. Um, and actually, um, the Mine Action community is also very close to my heart because I used to work for um, MAG in DRC and in Libya not so long ago, actually. So um, very nice to see everyone. Wonderful. So many more connections that I thought we'd had. So we have uh, friends in the, in the Surf Secretariat who actually know our business very well. Excellent. Um, great. Um, I think we're going to uh, start with the presentation. So in terms Sorry, of the... Christelle, yeah? just a quick yeah? interruption. Um, there's a hand raised by Keiko Tamura. Uh, yes, Keiko? Sorry, it was a mistake. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. No, no worry. Uh, welcome, Keiko. Um, so in terms of agenda, we'll do an, an intro of um, 10 minutes, and then we will have the presentation by the Surf Secretariat for about 30 minutes. Then we'll have a Q&A for 30 minutes, and around 3.15, 3.10 actually, we'll be joined by Gina Bernal, who works with uh, uh, the UNMAS program in Colombia. She's the, the, one of the coordinators there, and she's going to speak about their experience with uh, receiving soft funding for the project in Colombia. I've shared the, the project uh, with invitation yesterday. Uh, and then we'll have a, a wrap up uh, and any AOB, and we can just um, continue with our program. So if that's OK, um, let's start with the PowerPoint. So I'll do the first five slides and then uh, head over to uh, uh, to Robert. So okay, so UN Surf, yes, so it's a United Nations Central Emergency Response Fund. So the agenda for today is an overview of the Surf to be funded to be followed by uh, an explanation of how the underfunded emergencies window works. Next, um, our colleagues from SURF will talk about the life savings criteria. Then we'll talk about the four priorities of the emergency relief coordinator, and then opportunities and challenges uh, in getting more support from SURF for mine action. Next, please. Okay. OK, OK, so. So Jeremy, who has been putting together this presentation, uh, is actually helping me right now to operate uh, this presentation, and I wanted to um, to uh, to also thank him for helping prepare all this. Um, but what's what's really important is that uh, you know that the SURF is the Global Emergency Response Fund of the UN. It kickstarts emergency operations and helps to meet the gaps in humanitarian responses. <clears throat> Sorry, Christelle, you muted yourself. Yeah, just, just I was just saying that there's actually three mod modalities. Uh, for of funding with SURF. It started by being just a loan facility. The SURF up until 2005 was lending money to the UN agencies who had to reimburse. And in 2005, Yann Eglan said that doesn't work uh, because, you know, UN agencies had to find donors who basically pledged to give them money so they would reimburse. And what, what uh, Jan Eglin really wanted was the ability to give grants to UN agencies to respond faster 
and and more equitably uh, to to emergencies. So we push very hard for this new uh, uh, component, the gr grand component uh, for uh, of surf. And this grand component is made of two different windows: the rapid response window and the underfunded window. So of course, all of this had to be negotiated with with member states and. At the time, they were very, very supportive of rapid response because they just had, you know, the tsunami in 2004, and and they realized the importance of having rapid response uh, funds for for uh, responding faster to to emergencies. For the underfunded window, it was harder, but uh, we did manage to get that in. Um, and and this underfunded window is incredibly useful because it helps us to bring money to uh, underfunded emergencies. So I really like that. And I thank Jan Englund for his incredible diplomacy and advocacy uh, to create this underfunded window back in 2005 as part of the humanitarian reform. Now, who is eligible for soft funds? So UN funds, programs and specialized agencies. However, NGOs can indirectly also access those funds through uh, UN agencies. And recently, uh, 25 million was provided to NGOs through IOM for the COVID response. So the SURF is also relevant to NGOs. Next, please. Now, take a look at this graph. So on the, on the left side, you can see that between 2005 and 2019, the, num the amount, the volume of surf funds going to mine action has been going up slightly, right? And you can see the name of the program. So um, last year, Mali, DRC, Colombia, and Afghanistan received surf funding. So my dream is that all our mine action uh, coordinated programs would receive soft funded, especially if it's if they are underfunded. And we've talked a lot, a lot in other webinars of the fact that victim assistance was underfunded. So I've, I'm always pushing for us to have a victim assistance project uh, that we can, you know, uh, uh, basically promote with the surf in case no other donors uh, funds it. But anyway, we're looking at we're looking at a very positive trend between 2015 and 2019. But we're also looking at on the right side, if you look at the surf allocation per sector, mine action is all the way at the bottom. So mine action gets very, very little. Um, you can see that the, the first recipient is food assistance, health, Water and sanitation uh, receive huge amount of, of funding from SURF, but mine action very little. So I really see a potential for, for growth in this area. Next, please. OK, um, shall I go ahead and hand over to Robert for the next slides, please? Hi, right, Christelle, I'm going to take it for this slide and then we're going to hand over to colleagues. So thank you for the, the really nice overview of SURF. So I think like Christelle mentioned, this is a great opportunity and she said a few very key words that this is untapped potential. There's a lot of potential. Um, the statistics say everything that mine action is, can access SURF funds. She mentioned it's the UN's um, emergency fund. So the, the funds are available. The challenge is how to increase the amount for mine action and does it really fit so surf is a, is a certain thing and then there are needs that many agencies have so what is where does it fit and where does it not fit and that's what we're going to look at a little more closely today so if you walk away from the presentation knowing even just one thing about surf remembering one thing is that we really have kind of as christelle mentioned two types of grants two products if you like one is the rapid response and as as christelle mentioned to describe why it was created. There was some inefficiency. So what we're known for is the rapid response. What we're less known for, but is I think a great opportunity for UNMAS and, and other agencies is the underfunded emergencies window. And Rob is going to get into some of the details. But if you look on the screen, you might see some things you're not, you don't always see, neglected emergencies. 
uh, some terms that we use quite a bit. What does it mean to be neglected? It could mean many things. So emergencies that very often have actually shifted from that rapid response to underfunded emergencies phase. Um, and we'll get into, Rob will get into some of the details, um, but that is where there are, there is a significant portion of SERF's annual, we'll say for now 500, and it's, and it's been growing million per year. Um, what is also interesting is the time frame, nine months versus six months. And, and Rob will get into the details, but that has even been expanded. This round and might maybe going forward would be up to a year. So what does that mean for mine action? Well, we've noticed the projects we have funded have asked for extensions. There's been challenges um, because of the environment. Um, I remember a project where in Libya where training um, landmine, we'll call them experts, needed to move several times because being in Libya wasn't an option. So that took quite a bit of time. But these are emergency grants. So you can imagine our donors not looking right now at long-term grants the way other funds or traditional don donors might. So we are really trying to inject money into certain timeframes. And then the, the big difference is where this starts. So if you see rapid response, it is a request. Um, you can imagine Mozambique cyclone, there was a request. When Yemen, when the conflict first started in Yemen, HCs make a request to Mark Lowcock, who Christel mentioned is the USG, ERC, and manager of the fund. So it's initiated at headquarters. And what does that mean? You cannot apply for underfunded emergencies grants. However, and I'm going to get in a little bit of detail, Rob, there's two annual rounds and then 100 million on average 100 million per round is allocated to countries that are decided through an analysis at hq what does that mean for unmas many of the countries have unmas operations not all there are drought affected um maybe countries that were in cyclone situations mozambique for example has shifted to an underfunded but there are afghanistan a few other countries um, in the past mali has for sure gotten underfunded emergency grants. Colombia, I believe this round is is also has been determined to be underfunded and neglected. So with that, I'm going to hand over to colleagues. I'm going to hand over to Rob. Rob, and um, we're just going to ask Jeremy to kindly go to the next slide every time we need to shift. So over to you, Rob. Yeah, thanks, Samir. And thanks also, Christelle, for the uh, very interesting, you know, historical <clears throat> background, because I think it is helpful to to sort of couch it in that uh, framework of the you know humanitarian reform efforts around 2005 and the whole concept of the underfunded emergencies window is really you know couched in this whole um, you know idea of the CNN effect and how the media quickly moves on from crises and and there are many protracted crises as we as we all know many of which Unmass works in uh, that remain uh, underfunded and and forgotten emergencies so. Yes, as I said, I, I run the underfunded emergencies uh, window. It operates twice a year. Uh, so round one was dispersed in March. Uh, round two, we're in the middle of now. Um, it will be dispersed around September. So just for your information, it's it's based on a very um, sort of complex and in-depth statistical uh, sort of qualitative and quantitative analysis. So every round we will look at every hrp country will be eligible for the underfunded round plus a select number of non-hrp countries uh we will then um plot all of those countries on a uh, on a on a scatter plot so basically to look at levels of funding um so we look at the most underfunded crises and then we also have a whole uh, composite series of indicators that look at uh, vulnerability, various uh, aspects of vulnerability, you know, food insecurity, health, uh, protection concerns, etc., cetera, um, as well as risk of conflict. And we build in, you know, inform at the global level and inform um, subnational. So it is, and then we also have a very in-depth sort of consultation process um, at HQ, uh, within OCHA, outside of OCHA with the NGO community through ICVA. Um, so it is quite a, a, a respected and fair process, I think, in terms of um, choosing the selecting the countries. And as this slide, you know, shows, I mean, it can it can sort of run the whole gamut of humanitarian crises from 
you know, underfunded operations, Nigeria, for example, um, you know, it's, it's HRP is, is very, very underfunded and, and, uh, you know, rising um, food insecurity um, uh, risks, you know, perennially at the, at the risk of famine, protracted conflicts, you know, Afghanistan also um, sort of rising, rising food insecurity, according to the latest IPC data, uh, the drawdown of US troops, you know, we'll, we'll build in a lot of that um, uh, analysis in terms of, of the countries we choose. Um, you know, severe drought in Honduras. Um, we've, uh, in the last round, we also funded Guatemala. We're funding, funding Colombia this time round. Um, so if you want any more details on the, uh, we have the SURF Index for Risk and Vulnerability in the methodology note, which is published on our website for each round. So we'd be happy to um, share that with you just so you get a better idea of how I know sometimes it's a bit of a mystery how we choose these countries, but it is a, <clears throat> it is a very sort of well-developed quantitative and qualitative process. So Jeremy, just the next slide, please. So w one of the things I would definitely, you know, if you're interested in surf, encourage you all to check out is the, is the life-saving criteria. Now, Obviously, um, surf is a, you know, a drop in the ocean of, of overall humanitarian and, of course, certainly development funding. But, you know, typically we, we bring in around 450 million a year. This year was a little bit higher because of a one off uh, different contribution. But typically it's around sort of 450, 500 million. So we have to basically ensure that, that every, <coughs> excuse me. Every dollar that we spend is is very well targeted in, in terms of humanitarian life saving assistance. So this is our kind of you know our blueprint or our, our manual, if you like, the surf life saving criteria. Um, you know it ensures that we that we um, adhere to our mandate. It's certainly the main consideration when we when we review projects, what's eligible, what's not eligible. And it sort of clarifies definitions and, and determines, you know, what's uh, what, what's eligible for surf assistance. So I would definitely recommend that we can share that with you. So next slide, Jeremy. So you, you'll see in the life saving criteria, um, there is a section um, under protection for, for, for mine action. So it's very specific on, on the things that we would consider. Um, now, if you do, if you do end up submitting a project and, you know, there, there's some, something in a gray area, we will always, our program team will always discuss it with you and, you know, try to be flexible. But, but in a sense, it's, it's fairly well codified in the life-saving criteria. So, you know, emergency survey, clearance of, temp, uh, of temporary resettlement areas. So you can see the word temporary there. I mean, because the grants are typically obviously six months for rapid response, but underfunded nine or now 12 months, it's still... A relatively short period of time so we don't typically fund like you know for example long trainings or you know staffing positions that you know go go well beyond six months and don't have any um sustainability plan um so so we're looking for the, that kind of short-term sort of intervention emergency clearance um of identified uh, temporary settlement areas return areas mine risk education um uh, next slide jeremy And, uh, we, you know, also community liaison, emergency survey and, and clearance of explosive ordnance um, to restore access. So these are some of the key words, you know, to restore access, to deliver life saving assistance. Uh, well, yes. Sorry, uh, can I just interrupt you for one yes, of second? Course. Yes, of course. This slide is a slide that uh, that we've added. This is what the mine action area of responsibility has proposed to be added in terms of activities as you are updating the life saving criteria. So this, I don't think this has been approved yet, but I'm really hoping that this will be approved by the e, uh, ERC uh, very soon, including right. community liaison and assistance to victims, uh, which so far was not in the activities listed uh, in, the, in the life saving criteria document. Thanks for, thanks for clarifying that, Christelle. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I checked the, the previous version. I mean, I think it, it looks, it, yeah, it, it, it should be cleared quite soon, actually. So, uh, yeah, fingers crossed on this. But, but I think the, the overall point is to, to make that demonstration in terms of like, you know, restoring access, delivering life-saving assistance. Those are some of the, 
some of the words and phrases that we're, that we're looking for. Um, you know, if, if you can kind of make those kind of arguments in your uh, in your project proposal, I think it has a good chance of going forward. So uh, next next slide. Um, so maybe just one point before I hand on to uh, Julia is going to talk a little bit about the, um, the ERC's four priorities. So, uh, well, just to say that um, for this round, and there was a press release that went out last uh, last week, but uh, Afghanistan has been selected for the UFE uh, for 13 million, Nigeria for 13 million, uh, Mozambique for 7 million, uh, Burkina Faso for 6 million, Pakistan, 6 million, Burundi, 5 million, uh, Colombia, 5 million, Haiti, 5 million, Uganda, 5 million. I can put all this in the chat. And Yemen, 35 million. But Yemen is going to be focused on public health and um, women and uh, women and girls. Um, but just to say, yeah, I, I can put all that information in the chat. And there's also going to be... Um, a, uh, a, uh, a special GBV window that, that, that will be provided, um, a, a, an extra amount that will be provided to any HCT that can demonstrate uh, a very sort of positive and impactful um, GBV project at the field level. So, um, you know, we, we do expect the four steers and GBV to be mainstreamed in projects, but there is also uh, a, an additional window that will be eligible to HCTs. Now, just to clarify, those countries have been selected. It still is up to, you know, the HCs and the HCTs to uh, undertake the prioritization um, strategy in country. So I would definitely encourage, like it doesn't necessarily mean because these countries are selected that UNMAS at the country level is automatically selected. That is decided by the HC on the ground. So I think we'll get to some of those opportunities in a, in a little bit, but I would definitely encourage UNMAS to be, you know, at the table um, at the HCT and, and, and advocating for uh, advocating for your projects and your interventions. Um, so I will hand on to Julia to talk about the four priorities. Thanks, Rob. Um, yeah, so in um, in early 2019, I think the um, emergency relief coordinator uh, sent out a communication to um, resident coordinators and humanitarian coordinators and um, really encouraged them to take into consideration um, these four priorities um, for uh, projects put forward by the um, country-based pooled funds as well as the SURF. Um, and, the, and he felt that these uh, four areas have uh, not been um, sufficiently uh, taken into consideration in um, funding prioritization strategies in the past. Um, and so he's um, he wanted to um, to bring those a little bit to bring more attention to these um, and uh, and actively have uh, country teams um, consider them. So um, as as Rob said, considering um, does not necessarily mean that um, every one of those um, has to be uh, included in a surf allocation or that. Um, that you know you have to have a special project uh, for each of those. That's not the case. Um, in fact, um, you know several of them um, work much better when they're when they're mainstream. But um, it's it's just it's an effort to um, to be a lot more conscious about these four areas. Um, and the first one is support for women and girls, including tackling gender-based violence, reproductive health, and empowerment. Um, the second one is programs targeting disabled people. The third one is education and protector crises. And the fourth one is other aspects of protection. And um, and so while it's um, so two, I think two points I want to make is that um, one is it's important to demonstrate um, in a in a sort of application that these have been uh, considered, but there may also be good reasons for um, not including uh, one or the other in, in a SURF uh, application. I think we recently had an example um, where the country team explained that they hadn't included any um, education projects because there was another donor, um, I think Education Cannot Wait, that had just funded a big uh, program um, in the country. So they, they had that aspect um, covered. 
Um, and the second point I want to make is that this could be particularly useful for um, mine action, um, given the um, the emphasis on people with disabilities, uh, as well as um, and so considering, for example, um, victims um, of uh, of landmines and IEDs, etc., um, or um, you know, uh, considering mine action under um, other aspects of protection. So I think this is something that um, that the mine action community can really uh, use strategically um, in in discussions um, at country level when it comes to prioritizing uh, areas for a surf um, application. Next slide. All right, so um, just uh, speaking a little bit more about uh, under the the opportunities that we really see for the um, mine action community, um, as uh, I think Samir um, and Rob highlighted, the the underfunded emergencies um, are are most likely the the best opportunity. So we spend about 200 million to 225 million per year on uh, allocations under the uh, UFE window. And um, these are spread across, roughly across 140 projects, uh, some of them larger, um, some of them smaller. And, and we really see this as an, as an opportunity uh, for, uh, for Mine Action um, to, to receive some, some funding for SURF. For the rapid response window, it's sometimes, I think it's sometimes a little bit more difficult um, if, you know, in, in a in a drought situation when when there's a focus when the country team decides to focus on sort of livelihoods and and um and food security etc related to drought then that it, then it's sometimes a bit more difficult to bring in um, a mine action project um but um but in in the underfund but that's not to say that that rapid response is um it's never appropriate especially when you know when we see areas where um i think in in northeastern nigeria there was a case where where in some areas became newly accessible to the humanitarian community um because um because of the conflict um and then um and then those types of things could be very relevant but the uh, the underfunded emergencies are are um most likely the uh, um, the uh, a really good opportunity um, and then to sort of what can you we were thinking about you know what can you do at country level um to uh, to be there and, and really um take advantage of of those opportunities and um and it's for that it's really important to engage in the humanitarian uh, coordination system in the uh, protection cluster um, and you know, have the protection cluster coordinator on your side to to speak on behalf of mine action in the intercluster coordination, and and have a strong presence in the HCT when it comes to those prioritization uh, discussions, and um, because this is where where those strategies are are being decided. It's at at the surf secretariat level. There's only a limited um, we have limited influence over what countries prioritize. When they come to us um, with an application, this is all sorted out. So it's really at the country level where those uh, discussions take place and where you can um, have most uh, influence in, in bringing in a, uh, a mine action um, project. Next slide. All right, so um, just to uh, some of the the, the challenges um, that we that we thought about, um, obviously within um, within the um, protection uh, cluster as well, this requires quite a lot of uh, coordination um, or in general um, at surf allocation, we're um, cognizant that this does require a lot of uh, a lot of coordination and a lot of um, effort um, and uh, you know, you just you have to be there um, in order to um, to be able to to participate, and in and the protection uh, cluster especially has all of these uh, different subsections um, that are that are also quite different uh, from from mine action. So it's not always so um, so easy to um, you know to uh, to uh, come to the front there and and be able to. Uh, convince everyone else that um, that mine action is um, something that must be uh, supported, even though we all know it it should be. 
Um, and then also we we do encourage everyone to to engage very actively with the um, OCHA country offices. Um, that's um, because they facilitate the surf process um, and they will they will very much um, uh, influence and sort of and, and just run the process and help um, get the prior put the prioritization strategy together um, they may come up with a with a proposal so engaging with them uh, directly is is also useful in countries where there is a country-based fault fund I think most of you know that this is usually the humanitarian uh, the funding coordination section or the humanitarian financing unit um, that also manages the country-based port fund they usually deal with us uh, with the surf um, applications um, and it's good to be in in touch with them and then um, finally we surf is is as as Robin Samir um, and Christelle explained we're on this sort of extreme humanitarian side of the spectrum. So we fund the first uh, sort of six months um, of, of a new response, um, or we fund um, uh, these uh, underfunded sectors in an ongoing response. But it's um, it's really important to to know our criteria and, um, and make sure that um, whatever you're doing fits in with those and that the funding is not used to, to fill sort of gaps in, in development funding or um, you know, or anything along those lines, but really, um, and I think that's why we highlighted in the life saving criteria, the sort of the context. So yes, we fund risk education and survey and clearance and so on. Um, but that can sometimes also be a development, more of a development activity. So it's, it's really important to, um, to very clearly explain the humanitarian context that you're operating in, which makes these uh, interventions so relevant. Um, so I think that's just uh, about it. The next slide I think is handing back to Samir. Yes, so back to Samir, thank you. Thanks very much, Julian. Thanks, Rob. So you have a bit of a, a crash course on SURF, and I think we really tried to zoom in on, on the relevance for UNMAS. So where to get more information? Always, I would suggest checking the SURF website. Most UN websites are not great. Um, they're not the places that we usually go to for, for really the latest information, but surf.un.org has every single grant, including a lot of the grants, of course, that have gone to UNMAS um, right there with the details. So you can see the history, what has UNMAS uh, received, what is the latest news, what are the updates on things like that Julia mentioned, the ERC's four priorities, etc. So highly recommend it. And then the SURF Handbook, something um, that's not that well known is something called the SURF Handbook. It's available on our website. You can Google search it and it gives you, um, it elaborates um, on a lot of what we spoke about today, especially the underfunded emergencies window that Rob mentioned. Now, within UNMAS, who would you go to? I'm going to highly recommend, and I don't know if you saw this on the slide, Christelle, your name, your email. Um, I know that there hasn't been a lot of contact maybe during the rounds or during the underfunded with UNMAS, but I really strongly suggest, especially since she's a SURF alumni, to get in touch with Christelle. Jeremy, if we go to the next slide, I don't want to preempt Colombia, but I, I do want to just maybe touch on the big points. So a success story, UNMAS Colombia MRE sessions and psychosocial workshops. There were a lot of MRE workshops and support to survivors and families. So I'm going to let Colombia discuss this and I'm going to hand back over to Christelle and we can do some Q&A. So Christelle, back over to you. Thank you very much, Julia, Samir and Rob. Extremely useful presentation. Two points before we go to the Q&A. One, UNMAS is the MAAOR lead but in a number of countries at the globe uh, for instance in yemen and ukraine and myanmar unmas doesn't have a presence and it's either unicef or undp who are the ma co coordinator uh, so and of course as un agencies undp uh, and unicef can also receive uh, funding from from the surf and they actually do 
uh, receive a lot of funding for, for from the surf, but I think probably very little for mine action compared to other activities and other projects they submit to the surf. So I just wanted to, to make uh, this point. And, and secondly, Keiko made a very important point. It's a terminology point, uh, but it's important. Uh, and actually the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights was leading in changing this terminology. We don't talk about disabled people, we talk about persons with disability, and uh, I apologize for uh, this uh, oversight in the, in the priorities of the ERC. Um, maybe uh, uh, somebody needs to uh, change that. Uh, so now that I've made those two points, I'm going to open it up for questions. So please use uh, your hand. You can uh, raise your hand if you have a question. And I will give the floor. Um, and we have until 3.10 for question and answer before we start on Colombia. So don't be shy. Go ahead, ask questions or make comments, share your experience with SURF. Keiko, go ahead. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Keiko and uh, I'm the ex-UNDP staff, so I understand the agency position, etc, etc. And then uh, I'm currently based in Mataki, responding to the severe crisis. And the first, for the last three years, we are implementing survivor assistance project in the northwest of the Syria. I have, I'd like to throw the two questions here. And especially I'm talking about from the field perspective. I understand when must have the agenda, you want to put the agenda forward, which is completely understood. But from the beneficiary point of view, it doesn't matter where the money is coming from. Especially this emergency fund have a heavy in the food and the heads, for example. I must thinking, is a must responsibility try to do by yourself or try to ensure all this money provided by other agencies for the health of the food supply going to be mainstream. So we must could be leading for the mainstreaming of the MA survivor should be included, not left behind. And another question for me, I understand it's also agency agenda, but in the field we have a huge trouble to targeting the MA victim or EO victim. Following a non-discriminatory principle of the humanitarian action, we have to target everyone. And then our project needs to be ensured that, okay, not my victim or your victim cannot be left behind. So it is our responsibility. But how much is the added value to put in clearly saying, for example, that new priority or activity, clearly saying any victim should be targeted. So I'm sorry, I'm just opening up the two questions, but kind of this is kind of the dilemma I'm facing in the field. The beneficiary need and the agency driven agenda. So I just stop here. Thank you. Okay. Um shall we try to answer those questions before we go to Francesca, who is also working in the, in CIA? Um, yeah, so, Samir, Christo, Julia, maybe you could elaborate and, and maybe just uh, summarize some of the questions that came from your colleague. Uh, yeah, so Keiko, it was a little hard to understand because it seems that there was uh, a child yelling in the background. But from what I understood, uh, your concern is that the surf are allocated based on uh, trade or how do you say negotiations between UN agencies and do not reflect what the beneficiaries need is that is that what you what the first questions was yeah 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 that's the thing like for for the role of the mass in the CRF going to increase your profile I understand it is your it is your responsibility or it is probably your goal to increase the profile of the mass but to make sure other agency getting the money out of this pocket, actually including the MA victim, for example, yeah, 
or if the education money is getting for an emergency in education, then we also need to make sure and we need to be mainstreamed. So that's the that's the question for me. It is only the sort of purpose of that we must try to increase the percentage from 1.3 or increase the impact of the MA activity across the different agencies. Okay, so uh, so I, I, th I think it's actually a question for me because I'm I'm the mayor, I might actually be our representative here, and I'm also the UMS representative. So to be very clear, why did I organize this meeting? It's not about UNMAS, it's not about UN agencies. The reason why I invited all partners of all MAOR partners, most of which are NGOs, is to make you realize that through UNMAS or UNDP or UNICEF or other UN agencies, you can uh, get funding from SURF for uh, your most critical needs for life-saving projects. So frankly, I don't care whether the money goes through one agency or the others. What's really important for us is that it is based on needs assessment and well coordinated. And this is how the SURF works. And this is an opportunity for, uh, for, for the mine action NGOs to take or leave. If you have enough money through other channels, that's fine. But if you don't, this is one possibility. So that's that's the main point I wanted to say on this. Um, uh, and, uh, yeah? Stella, I'm happy to add a couple of points. After you, I'm happy to add a couple of points to this question. Uh, yes. Oh, but I didn't mean to interrupt you. Sorry, when you're done. <laughs> yeah, just OK. No, no, no problem. Secondly, what I've been see seeing and hearing from many NGOs like Handicap International, like your NGO, Keiko, is that victim assistance is incredibly underfunded. We've done a huge amount of advocacy, key messages for all members of the MAOR to use to say, you know, we need to get the message out that even if there's more, uh, you know, advocacy around person with disability, what we're seeing is that victims and survivors of explosive ordnance are not getting the assistance they need. And so for me, the surf is an incredible opportunity because they focus on addressing what, you know, neglected emergencies, underfunded projects. So here's another reason why we're here today. So either you use the opportunity and work <coughs> with the coordinator, whether it's a UNDP or UNICEF or, or other coordinator to get your request through the humanitarian coordinators to the SURF, or you can also say this is too complicated a process to coordinate and I'm going to try to do fundraising my way directly through donors, which is completely fine, but I just want people to be aware because I want the maximum transparency because I've noted that in the mine action community, there was very different level of knowledge uh, on the surf and also that many other agencies and sectors are using the surf much more strategically than us. So over to you, Robert. Yeah, just quickly, uh, because I know we, we have other questions and we want to continue the discussion, but I just wanted to build on what Keiko has asked and, and what you've helpfully added, uh, Christelle, because I think we're we're all kind of on the same page. I mean, our, our interest in, in underfunded and rapid response is, uh, you know, as you said, that there's a, a strategy developed on the ground that makes sense based on needs assessments, based on the needs on the ground. We, we discourage, which I think Keiko may have been alluding to, the sort of cake cutting approach where everyone gets a bit of surf funding. No, we we and increasingly our management and donors are asking for strategic focused surf applications um, based based on needs and based on the best placed responders, including, you know, uh, national responders and, and localization and subcontracting to, to NGOs. And on the, the victim assistance piece, um, yes, I think you both highlighted it is a, it is a gap. It has been underfunded, um, hence it's part of the uh, four ERC strategic priorities so I think a, a real opportunity here um, to marry those both things but both facets up the needs on the ground 
with, you know, this is a huge need that's not been addressed and it's been underfunded. So I, I think we can couch it in terms of a clear opportunity. Thanks. Thank you very much, Robert. So we're moving on to the next question from Francesca Ciodani, who is the Mine Action AOR coordinator in Syria. Over to you, Francesca. Hi, thank you, Christelle. I, I, I hope everybody can hear me. I have a bit of an on and off internet. Um, first of all, thank you so much for the presentation. I think it was extremely useful. Uh, I have two questions from my side. and. Perhaps my first question could partially answer also what the Keiko was mentioning before. Um, first question is, I uh, read from your presentation, so there are sort of like two ways that you can feed into a, a surf um, allocation paper. So it's either HQ-led or field-led. Um, is there a standardized process of how th the process should go about? I'm asking this because um, last year, uh, the, if I recall correctly, there has been a surf allocation for Northwest Syria in particular. However, the passing on of information or how this everything went on was extremely confusing. And we ended up not just us, but the whole protection sector not being very much in the loop. Um, the lesson learned from that process was that it mostly, uh, all the discussion were mostly had between uh, main agencies. And the sector, on the other hand, were not that much involved. Um, as you as you all know, I guess, I mean, Syria is an extremely complex situation with different layers of response and all that comes with it. But then, so just wondering if there is a sort of standardized process so that I know um, I need to, to go and first talk to my protection sector or go and talk to my auto office. Because at least what happened last year, it was just there was a, a lot of information that came in very late when decisions were already made in terms of priorities. And nobody was really clear on the whole process on when we should have pitched in and nobody had sort of uh, put protection sector in the loop. That's one question. And second question, um, just uh, I would like to hear your take on non-cost extension, <laughs> um, I I understand. I mean, I I know that I mean, surf is mostly, as I said, emergency intervention, so it should be something that is needed immediately and on the point. However, in some contexts, I'm mostly thinking about Syria. Access to certain areas is not that easy. It can vary from day to day. So, if applying to one pro project, we one may have, yes, we, we we got green light and everything seems fine, and then the reality on the ground changes quickly. So just would like to hear what uh, your take on that and how flexible <laughs> with the no concentration is. Thank you. Gustav, it's okay. Um, I think I can try to answer, and then, of course, Robert and Julia come in. Um, I, I think the Syria case is an example of what fortunately what sometimes happens on the ground, some either sectors, agencies, and individual people are, are not in the loop. And we've heard this in the past. Um, our advice is to be in touch with the OCHA office or what we consider the focal point. So every underfunded round, we ask the HCRRC to identify the focal person. Normally the OCHA person in the OCHA office or in, if there is no OCHA office, the RCO. Um, you know, surf normally is what happens during surf is a reflection of the dynamics that existed well before surf in the country team so as you mentioned francesca a complex situation where there are a lot of actors a lot of agencies um, of course is going to make communication and what we ask for the erc asks for is normally a, a quick turnaround so once the letter is that is sent to the hc saying you will receive 13 million as rob said to nigeria there's an expectation of a quick turnaround because our donors expect quick turnaround money to be dispersed. We are on the clock. We measure the time it takes for a lot of these processes. So underfunded or not, uh, money needs to get to emergencies quickly instead of sitting in a bank account. Um, there is a certain amount of control the SERF has, and then there is a huge responsibility, as I mentioned before, accountability by the HCs and RCs to make decisions at the field level. Do people in New York know the best decisions? 
Absolutely not. We, we do, through Rob's analysis, identify the countries which data shows are the least funded. In that case, it was Syria. And yeah, it, it's a challenge to make sure all actors are, are in the loop. You know, I keep the advice, and we don't have a blueprint, is to remain in touch with OCHA, get in the coordination structures and coordination meetings. And this is huge advice for UNMAS. I talked to Christelle earlier before this, and I said, you know, some agencies need to just make a choice. Are they going all in on the humanitarian aspect? And, and I think other agencies have, like UNFPA has made a, a decision to, to look at their humanitarian operations and become highly operational and get involved in surf. So, you know, unfortunately, we don't have a great answer. It is an unfortunate case of being out of the loop, but but I do think um, the OCHA, OCHA is the answer. I, I'm, I'm not saying that because I'm biased. I'm saying it because that's the reality on the ground. In Sudan, I worked with Ingville, fantastic UNMAS colleague. What did she do? She came to the office. To your second question, and, and Rob and Julia, I'm going to make my point short because I know Rob has a lot of experience with NCEs now. No one wants to give money and then be told, well, I wasn't able to spend it. Not you, not a bank, not a donor. However, realities on the ground are different. Syria context, many contexts, the access becomes an issue. And that's why it exists. Um, what we and the ERC donors don't want is agencies say, well, you know, we just didn't get around to spending it. Hey, can we have three more months? So I think that's really the difference. Two buckets. One is outside control, the agency conflict, change, access, inside the control of the agency. We didn't click the button. We didn't hire the people. So I, I really just keep in mind the priorities, our priorities, what drives our decisions are the decisions and priorities of the donors. So if you put yourself in the shoes for a bit, and yes, they're not in the field always. They don't understand. So we're trying to bridge that gap. But I'm going to hand over to Robert maybe on more uh, NCE advice, because I, I want people to walk away from this. Knowledge is good, but action that you can take is better. So, Rob, if you have something. Uh, thanks, Samir. Yeah. Um, well, starting with the second question first on the no-cost extensions, I mean, as Samir said, you know, we, we, we want to see the money out there and, and, and used to, to good effect. Um, this year, we, of course, have the COVID situation, which has uh, ne necessitated us to be a lot more flexible than, than usual. Um, we will typically review the request on its merits. So if it's based on insecurity, if it's based on access constraints, uh, we will uh, typically um, approve it. If, it. if we think it's a systematic or a systemic issue within the agency around you know, administration blockages, then we might um, we might not not approve it and, and ask the agency to to go and fix those issues. But in general, we like to be flexible. Uh, the upcoming UFE round, we've made 12 months rather than nine to give everyone a few more a few more um, months. Um, so that's on NCEs. And, I, and then I agree with um, I do agree with Samir. Yeah, contact the local office. Um, uh, the, the four the four steers. The more I think of it, the more logical it is um, for mine action to 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 contribute to those four steers. So, and and we're starting to see the ERC uh, stronger language in our in our letters to the HC. Like we expect to see some impact and results in these areas. Um, so certainly, you know, if if our mass is strongly engaged with the with the protection strategy and country in the protection cluster. And then, you know, making sure the protection cluster is, is, is keyed into the HCT and, and the Archer office. Um, that's probably the best way to make your case at the, at the local level, I would agree, over for me. I think, uh, Julia, did you want to jump in? Yeah, thanks, Rob. Um, maybe just to add on the um, NCE question. Um, so I think, yes, we do try to be um, flexible in those extraordinary um, circumstances that are outside your control. but generally we discourage um, NCEs. It's not something that you should plan with. Um, SURF is, I think it's important to take into consideration um, that we have a very, very limited amount of funding. Um, whatever, 500 million um, or 800 million sounds like a lot, but it's not because we're, we're a global fund and we have to respond to, to everything and we're currently really, really stretched. And so the premise is that you know, that whatever is put forward is really the most urgent. And then if if there's a project that 
does not is not able to provide the assistance within the time period, then then our question is, was that really the most urgent thing to prioritize or wouldn't it have been better to spend the money on something else where services could have provided been provided in that time frame? And, you know, then you would have sorted out your agreements with government or whatnot and had, you know, and just had funding from another donor later on. So so I think that's those are kind of the questions that we have because it's because we're operating in this space with very limited funding and where everything is absolutely urgent and critical. Um, that that's why we, you know, we we have it not not allowing NCEs or discouraging NCEs is really about encouraging prioritization of the most urgent and and feasible. Um, and I think it's um. It's good to be, and I think Rob said this, it's good to be transparent. Um, for us, it's really, really helpful if in the proposal, um, we are at the very beginning, we're made aware that um, something, you know, that um, this project requires agreement from the government um, that's not there yet, um, and or, or it, it requires uh, agreement from a certain authority, and, you know, that, that looks likely. Um, and and then and then we can we can make the call, you know, um, and um, and and if there is a strong argument that this should be supported and we should take that risk, then then we can be happy um, to take the risk. But it's it's better if it's um, if it's made transparent from the beginning. Over. Thank you very much. A lot of uh, issues to unpack. So I'm going to follow up with uh, with two points. One, on this issue of uh, of the clock ticking, Samia, you just reminded me of when I worked in the Surf Secretariat in donor relation and communication, how much pressure I was putting on the program to, to uh, you know, work faster and show that Surf was and, and all the agencies were delivering program fast. And, and one issue, I think, for, for many agencies, and especially in mine action, is that Completing a project in nine months or even 12 months, if you move to 12 months, may be difficult. There are some activities, perhaps food distribution, that are uh, faster than, you know, doing uh, explosive ordnance risk education or uh, victim assistance or uh, which can take longer and also where sometimes it is important for us to to do a little bit of capacity building of the local uh, of the local community, for instance, in in terms of risk education, it's not just about the messages; it's also about the messengers, you know. And you need to take the time to train local, you know, uh, you know, head of NGOs or um, you know, head of schools or what, who will be able to have the trust of the community and do risk education. So nine months is, is sometimes tough. However, what's what I think I would encourage colleagues to do, and I, I'd like to hear what you think about it, uh, Samir, Rob and Julia, is, you know, work more together, basically make joint proposal, even if it's one UN agencies that's forwarding the proposals, maybe there's several NGOs that are also there that will help uh, deliver faster and make sure this can be delivered in, in nine months. So I'm thinking of packaging a little bit better so we can meet this uh, this no cost extension plan for the no cost extension extension and try to to meet those uh, those tough deadlines. So that was my first point. And then I wanted to ask you on the priority of the ERC of focus on person with disability. How does the, the ERC and the Surf Secretariat monitor that the HC proposals have mainstreamed that throughout the proposal? Yeah, thanks, Christelle. I think Julia has something, and then on the ERC's four priorities, Rob, um, I think this is super relevant right now, especially for the underfunded round. So maybe we can go Julia, Rob, and I agree with you, Christelle. Oh, um, it'd be important to hear from the field. I think Christelle is going to rejoin, but in the meantime, Julia, why don't we jump into those questions? Sure. Um, yeah, thanks. 
I think I think um, Christelle made some really important points, and um, I think for those of us who have uh, worked in in Mine Action, we know that um, that some of those things, um, especially uh, some of the clearance tasks, um, can just take take time, um, and uh, so so it's and then the question is just you know is that if it takes so long is that for surf um, uh, or or is that um, for for others. Um, I think uh, there there are plenty of things that um, can be done with surf. I, I remember when I was um, working um, in DRC, uh, we had a um, surf funded uh, project uh, through Unmass, and what was challenging were the the targets. It was it was feasible to do this project within nine months, but what was really really challenging were the were the enormously high targets of how many people. Um, we would have to reach through um, MRE sessions, um, and and I think there, uh, for surf, we're we're interested in realistic beneficiary figures. Um, it's it's uh, and and this is something that comes through often at the reporting stage. We don't want overblown reporting figures because we need to um, justify to our donors, you know, how how much a surf project costs. Um, and, and if the beneficiary figures are like entirely overreached or blown out of proportion, that does not help us. Um, so, so we really um, encourage to be realistic and, and maybe that um, also helps with, uh, with the feasibility um, of some of the projects. In terms of capacity building, um, I think there are also plenty of really good examples um, of how this is being done and how this is um, in, in the mine action sector and how this is sort of integrated into um, regular programming. Um, again, if um, in with MAG and DRC, there was a, um, a cooperation with the with the Red Cross where um, all of the um, all of the um, risk education um, uh, project teams were uh, were from the Red Cross. So that was sort of um, and the team lead was was from MAG. So that was sort of an ongoing um, investment into um, into the capacity of the Red Cross um, in terms of community liaison um, and that was that could totally be um, part and parcel of um, of of those um, of those uh, of that time so it wasn't because surf doesn't fund um, capacity uh, building um, as such um, but this was this was sort of part of a larger um, larger setup um, and it and it was um, absolutely feasible to do in that context so um, so I think there there are actually lots of um, solutions uh, in the sector already back to you Samir cool um, Rob I think did we have something on ERCs for priorities um, I think the, the question for Christelle was about measuring it anything any thoughts on that we can share yeah, I mean, I, to be to be very frank and honest, I, I think it's a work in progress. It was launched in early 2019. Um, we've built it into our you know strategy uh, and project uh, templates, where we ask um, the the uh, country submitting the strategy to articulate um, how they're mainstreaming the four priorities, or or as the case may be, to note that it's not relevant for the particular context. I mean, there are times when, say, education and emergencies may not be may not be relevant for that particular strategy, or there may be another donor like Education Cannot Wait that's that's filling the gap. So um, I think on measurement, we still have a long way to go to be to be very candid. Um, so, you know, we're definitely open to, to suggestions and ideas. Um, we, we have that kind of um, narrative explanation in the strategy for the four steers, um, but we're looking at some some potential kind of indicators and quantitative ways of, of measuring it. Um, it, it's a tricky one because SURF is essentially needs-based, um, but we recognize that historically these four areas have been very underfunded. So um, particularly in the case of this round, we have put a specific allocation around GBV. So it's mainstreamed and it's targeted as well. And there could be opportunities in future to do that for other areas like people with disabilities and other aspects of protection. Um, so watch this space. There could be another round that's focused on, you know, maybe another one of the four steers. Um, so in a nutshell, I would say it's a bit of work in progress. Um, we're, we're sort of tracking it. We've just had a review 
come out of the four steers that we're looking at closely in terms of just you know making improvements on them. Thanks. Thanks, Rob. Uh, Christelle, I see you're back. We, we we haven't missed a step, so I, unless you feel otherwise, I'll hand back over to you. Thank you very much. Yes, I must have pressed the the wrong button. I was suddenly mm -hmm. expelled from uh, from the conference. Sorry for that. Thanks for being my backup. Um, okay, so I think that uh, Gina has joined us uh, and can uh, share with us her experience uh, from the Colombia perspective. Gina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Christelle. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Uh, so I'm going to, uh, can I turn my... I think, Gina, that you're muted. Can you please unmute yourself? Yeah. Uh, I think I cannot share my screen. I just sent you my presentation so if you can share it, please. Jeremy, can you can you share it with the group, please? Is that okay? Yes, I'll uh, I'll share it right now. Thank okay. you. Very much. So, um, to express to introduce yourself and say what you do in uh, in the in Colombia. Yes. Okay. So I'm Gina Bernal. I'm associate uh, pro uh, program officer in Onmas Colombia, and I'm also coordinator the coordinating the mine action area of responsibility here in uh, in Colombia since 2018. So uh, I'm gonna explain very quickly how was our experience uh, with this third funder funded uh, allocation we received uh, last year. Uh, next, Jeremy, please. So um, this is what I'm gonna share with you today. First, how it was our application process, and I'm going to give you some of the uh, key uh, things we had to take into account for our uh, proposal. Um, I'm going to share a little bit about the project. Also, uh, yesterday, Crystal sent you the document, share with you the document. I'm going to share a bit what uh, was this project about and its activities and results. Uh, how was the reporting for this surf underfunded? Uh, and then some best practices and lessons learned uh, we identified during this process. Next, Jeremy, please. So uh, I think this process uh, was already very well explained by the surf police. So I'm going to um, develop and elaborate a little bit more about how to prepare the proposal. But the first thing is, um, after we received in Colombia the notification from the CERF secretary, the HCT uh, held several discussions on what uh, priority uh, areas and populations we wanted to uh, benefit from this uh, project. Um, this for us was very important to have an HNO and HRP in, in Colombia because we already had assessed uh, most of the of the needs in different the different regions in the country. As you may know, Colombia has uh, suffered from a, a armed conflict for more than sixty years, and also for the last five or six years, we have a migration crisis due to the political and socioeconomical situation in, in Venezuela. So uh, all these needs were already uh, compiled and, and assessed in the in our HNO. So uh, taking into account all those needs assessment, the HGT uh, prioritized four regions in Colombia, we call them uh, departments. So it was Arauca, Norte de Santander, near the Venezuelan border, and then Chocó and Nariño in the Pacific coast in Colombia, where the armed conflict has been um, in developing in for the last maybe two or three decades. And we have lots of also um, coca crops in those two regions. So. Uh, then the HCT asked the clusters and subcluster to prioritize municipalities and areas of intervention and some of the projects. So there we, as um, the subcluster, the mine action subcluster, we had to ask to the NGOs um, working in these four departments what uh, the most affected municipalities in the 
in these uh, regions uh, were and what were the areas where this emergency response was required. So they provide us with this uh, with information about municipalities, uh, prioritized areas, and also they gave us an estimation of how many people we could reach with these um, activities. Uh, and so we had a, a discussion around what could be the activity we had to develop in those uh, regions and if we could as um, the mine action sector in Colombia, we could prioritize the four um, departments that were prioritized and part of the strategy sent to the CERF, secretariat by the humanitarian uh, country team. So we decided that yes, it was very important because these four departments were some of the most uh, mine affected departments in the country with lots of uh, victims and accidents registered in the last uh, few years and where the uh, conflict was very active and the conflict dynamics uh, were uh, still very act active. So we presented a proposal on the four, um, the four uh, departments with some uh, specific municipalities to, to be uh, intervened. And also we already had an estimation of uh, beneficiaries and other indicators I'm gonna show you. Uh, thanks to the NGO, to the information provided by the NGOs uh, that are, um, are some of our uh, AOR members. Mm, with this information, we uh, prepare like a mm, summary of what we wanted to do and what this intervention was going to be about, and we share that information with the uh, RCHC to um, have it in the country strategy. It was uh, sent to the um, submit to the surf secretary and uh finally we received uh i think this uh colombia was notified of this underfunded allocation in february early february last year uh and i think that by march maybe we start preparing the the proposal when we um were notified also that the the strategy was approved and so these are some of the um, main points we had to take into account when uh, preparing our proposal. First thing was, uh, of course, consultation with NGOs working in prioritized areas, because even though we know the country and the context uh, of uh, mine action um, in the country and also explosive hazards in different departments, NGOs in Colombia are those implementing uh, risk education, victim assistance, and um, clearance in in these different departments. So we really needed to um, have all this information from them so that we could reach the most affected populations. So it was uh, very important. Then we, of course, you have to ensure that our activities adhere to the life-saving criteria. This is very important because sometimes NGOs uh, don't know this criteria, so they can propose different activities that are not um, in line with this um, criteria. Uh, so it was um, we held some discussions with um, potential implementing partners to be sure that all the activities were um, like same being uh, activities and were what we needed for an emergency response. Then we have to be uh, specific and clearly describe the activities. We could not just say um, we're going to provide uh, explosive ordinance risk education to these communities and victim assistance, but what kind of victim assistance if we're, uh, we were um, planning to uh, implement um, psychosocial uh, assistance or legal assistance or only uh, health assistance and um, like what kind of uh, activities we were supposed to uh, implement in those four areas. So that um, required us to um, really know what the context was in the four departments and municipalities we, have, uh, we had um, prioritized. And 
have enough information to decide on what activities were uh, the most important to implement with the short time we had for this project. It, this was a nine month um, project. Um, so it was uh, very important and we had some feedback from the secretariat about being more specific on these uh, activities. Uh, then speaking about the schedule, because as so I was saying this is a very short period of implementation, so you have to plan very well uh, your activities. And for us, it was very important to have the call for proposals and grant agreement uh, preparation signature uh, time in our schedule to be able to deliver all the activities we were planning. Because of course, this takes time. It's one or two months, depending on the kind of goal of proposal. And so we couldn't just start the project and uh, immediately start providing or develop, implementing all the activities we had planned. So it was very uh, important for us to ensure that the activities could um, be uh, implemented in the time we proposed. And then this part it was very important too. Um, we have to be very clear on how all the or the beneficiaries and populations were going to be involved uh, in the project, how they will be informed about the activities, how we will um, make sure that their needs were taken into consideration in um, our proposal and, of course, during the implementation of the activities we, we were proposing. So these were some of the key points we had to take into account while uh, preparing our proposal. Uh, then, of course, we had several um, exchanges with the CERF secretary to um, address some of their comments and some of the questions they might have about the implementation and how uh, mine action worked here in, in Colombia. And then finally in April, so it was about two months, two months and a half um, period to uh, discuss, prepare, and then get the, the proposal approved and start with the, the implementation. So this is very quick. And so you have, if you are gonna prepare your proposal, you have to make sure that you start earlier and that you identify the, pro the kind of projects you could implement with the clusters and, and subcluster in country, uh, because this has to be uh, very quick to, to prepare um, the proposal. Next, Jeremy, please. So regarding the project, so as, uh, as I just mentioned, uh, our intervention was in the four um, prioritized regions for, for uh, the country strategy. Uh, so as I mentioned, Arauca, Chocó, Nariño, Norte, Santander. And we provided um, through four uh, grants over the two local NGOs. Uh, as I mentioned, they, they were already working there, so they really um, knew the region, and also they had already the metilis, um, and they have um, the communities recognize them as an as a partner. So it was uh, for us also important. So we we uh, granted uh, awarded these four grants to the local NGOs, and we provided communities from. Uh, uh, from these four regions. Uh, it is important also to say it was not just um, any community, but also indigenous and Afro-Colombian communities that uh, sometimes in the past had not had any contact with um, mine action organizations, so they hadn't had not uh, received any risk education or not even knew uh, about the risk they had because of the explosive hazards and contamination in, in their region. So th that was very important for us and it was uh, it was very successful project uh, because of that also. Uh, so we provided EOR uh, E to those communities and also um, victim assistance. As I told you, we had legal health and psychosocial assistance, not only to the survivors, uh, themselves, but also their families and their communities. 
uh, we had um, the NGOs had a um, let's say different approach because for for some of them um, the whole community was already uh, impacted and affected by the explosive hazards in their uh, regions. So they created and work in a different methodology to approach uh, these communities and make sure that they understand that uh, there was a risk and that they had to avoid, but also that, that they could uh, live their life by taking or, or having a, uh, let's say, a different behavior regarding this, um, this explosive hazard risk. Uh, so this is um, these are the targets we we had uh, when we planned the project, and then as you can see, we reached much more population. This was due not only um, to um, the, the work done by the NGOs, but also because we uh, had to uh, ask for a no cost extension due to them an increased number of new accidents in the four regions and also because we had several security challenges uh, in this department. I think this is um, something very, let's say, understandable because if we are uh, giving an emergency response, it's because the crisis is still active in those regions. So we had several uh, security issues during the implementation and also another challenge was um, that last year we had the local uh, elections in, in Colombia so there were several um, social leaders uh, killed and threatened so all these make difficult for uh, our implementing partners to implement all activities on, on time. And so we did request a no cost extension, but also on mass decided to um, use some other funds to support this project and ensure that the, the um, NGOs could reach uh, more people in the communities. And so that's why you see that we have reached with risk education much more um, beneficiaries than, than planned. And then, so we had the victim assistance. As I told you, this was a nine month length uh, project and we received $800,000 uh, um, from the surf allocation to Colombia. I don't know if I mentioned this, but it was $8 million last year. Jeremy, next, please. Uh, so regarding reporting, Gina, yes. I think it was 800,000, right? Was it eight? What can you clarify? 800,000. 800,000 for ONMAS, $8 million for Colombia. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, so, regarding reporting, we had two reports. The intermediate report was um, very short and it was. Uh, very specific on what were uh, the most important challenges for the project. Uh, if we expected to uh, spend all the budget we have requested and also what was the implementation status and um, some, as I, as I just said, some of the challenges we were facing and if uh, we had uh, um, our activities were being implemented on time. So this was very short and very, very concise, but it was uh, important to identify some of the delays we could have or if there were some um, municipalities or implementing areas where we could not really um, implement the activities we, uh, we plan to implement. So it was the first report. And then the final report is a, a longer report, very comprehensive where we had to present not only the, the overall performance of the project and our results, but also uh, what were the main challenges we faced, uh, how we did we address them. Um, if we requested an amendment, which was our case, uh, why and how uh, did we work uh, to achieve the, the proposed um, targets? Um, of course, all the beneficiaries 
in this in this is uh, we had to identify the different populations we we benefited with this uh, project also all the results uh, we achieved the, those i just share with you and uh how we as I told you, this is uh, very important for the proposal, but also in the report, how we ensured that local communities and beneficiaries were involved in the whole process and that we were really addressing uh, their needs. And also the complaint mechanisms that we uh, implemented and we or created uh, for the project to ensure that communities had how to uh, complain or report some of the situations that may happen uh, during the implementation both with onmas or the implementing partners uh, in the regions um and finally we were also asked to provide some success stories and some um case studies of human interest that then will be shared or have been shared in the surf uh, website this is uh, very important to show how communities are benefiting from the project and like to uh, highlight also the the human side of the project let's say uh, so there this was for us uh, um, also a good um, input not only for the surf report but also for our own uh, annual reports and, and other community products. Um, so this is for reporting and finally some next Jeremy please. Uh, some best practices and lessons learned um, identified identify for this project were first coordination with our agencies is very important in our case in, with UNICEF because they were also implementing uh, risk education projects uh, in the four regions. So we had to ensure that we were not duplicating activities in the prioritized municipalities. So we had this coordination during the preparation pr process, but also during the implementation of these, uh, of these projects to make sure that we were not both in the same municipalities reaching the same population in the same community. So that was um, very important uh, for us. Also, of course, as I said at the beginning of the presentation for us, it was um, necessary to um, ask for uh, NGOs to help us to prioritize the municipalities, intervention areas, et cetera. So this is very important because they are uh, the ones who really know what's happening in the regions at the moment when we prepare the project and also during the, the implementation. So um, this was key for the project. Then we had uh, this, as I told you, this uh, security issues during the implementation. And I think it is, um also key to take this into account while planning the project because we plan the project thinking that all commun all the um, uh, NGOs could uh, go to the communities with some let's say some security uh, issues that could happen but we didn't realize that there were more challenges due to uh, local elections so it is really important to take into consideration all the all the security context uh, in the um, implementation areas then have a close monitoring and um, an evaluation with the implementing partners for us was um, also key to ensure that targets were met within budget and schedule because um sometimes ips of course, they communicate with you when you require them to report their uh, progress, but sometimes they don't communicate on day on daily basis, um, like challenges they are facing. So uh, for us, it was very important to make monitoring visits, to be in contact with them all the time, to see 
and get to know what challenges they were they were facing if they could reach the communities how the project was um progressing so for us uh it was very useful and finally we promote and encourage knowledge sharing between the implementing partners because we realize that they, some of them had the same kind of challenges um, in the region, but they were having different responses. So uh, sometimes some were better than others. So we decided to make these um, workshops to share this knowledge and how they were uh, addressing the situations they were uh, facing to ensure that they could meet the targets in, in the budget. So this was um, some of the best practices we implemented and we think this was very successful and that may uh, was also instrumental to ensure that our pro project was successful and that we could really uh, benefit the um, communities we wanted to um, benefit with this uh, initiative. Okay, I did that next, Jeremy. That would be all about the project and the process. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you very much, Gina. It was very clear. Uh, and thank you for presenting such a successful um, case study. I think it will uh, inspire some colleagues. Uh, hopefully, in Nigeria, Afghanistan, Burkina Faso, Colombia, Yemen, Pakistan. Uh, which have been chosen for the uh, the upcoming underfunded window, and uh, and really I, I would stress the fact that uh, since we've shared your presentation and it was uh, your application and it was accepted by by the surf, I think those programs can just you know use similar languages and adapt it to their own needs uh, in order to be prepared to submit an application uh, if uh, if they can uh, you know convince uh, the humanitarian coordinator and the protection cluster that that whatever they do is uh, is the is a priority so we unfortunately have already reached the end of our time so i will um, thank the surf secretariat and Eugenia very much uh, for, for your for preparing this presentation and i will invite uh, colleagues who have uh, other questions to just contact us by email. Thank you so much. Samir, uh, would you like to say any final word? Just on, on behalf of Julia, Rob and I, thank you very much for the opportunity. It was really a pleasure to work with you again. And as Christelle mentioned, please let us know your questions. Thanks. OK, thank you all. Goodbye. Again. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.